dive in and uh, we'll get started. Okay, so this is a webinar. I've only done this, I think, one other time. Uh, and so uh, if it's rough around the edges, I apologize. But um, what I'd like to think about with this presentation is kind of touching on all of the different core areas of growth that as startup people, we should be thinking about. So that's why I call it a, a brief whirlwind or a whirlwind tour of growth. Uh, and really, we're going to dig into the major components that make up growth. And why not start with product road mapping, right? Because all growth comes on top of some kind of product or service that we're offering. And this is where a lot of folks just go wrong right, right out of the gates. They build, 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 and they put something out there and they try to market it and they realize that the thing that they built just doesn't really matter to the audience that they thought that it mattered for. And so when you're getting your features and ideas out into the wild, the, the way that I look at product management is through the lens of two different streams of work. There's all this stuff that you know you have to build. So if you are a media company and you don't have any content, well, you don't really have a product. So you kind of need to start with the content first and the way that you're going to deliver that content. If you're a travel company and you're selling tours and packages and you don't have a way for somebody to actually book tickets and to handle the transactional side of the of the ticketing you don't have a business so there's all these things that we know we need to build that become your idea stream and those absolutely should get put into a product backlog a sprint backlog we should do the sprint and then do the product release with those but the other side of this is what are you learning from the actual market what are customers potential customers leads telling you that you should be building and what are you learning through experimentation? So when I run product for different companies, I've done this throughout my career, I like to use an experiment stream. So all of these things that we're testing in front of net new users and current users to validate feature ideas and features before we go and spend a ton of time on them. The more you can get in this mindset where you've got an idea, you test that idea, you validate that idea resonates through some kind of core metric, then you build the full feature, the better you're going to be at actually scaling your startup. This is where this is where startups burn a ton of time and capital is on building stuff that nobody really cares about. And I actually ran a company into the ground by doing that, uh, and it was not fun at all. So I would urge you like holistically to think about your product strategy through the stream of, we know there's these things that we have to build, fine, go and build those. But a lot of the additional things that you're thinking about building, go and talk to customers and validate that there's real value in what you're about to build. Get that feedback loop going and build that into your work stream. The next thing is you can't really strategically grow your startup if you don't understand what you're actually tracking. And this comes down to building a growth model. Now there's a few components to a growth model. And for those of you that have taken the Master in Growth course or are interested in it, we get into a lot of detail with this stuff in that program. So I will not do it justice here, but put really simply, the main components of a growth model for your startup are a cost per unit. What are you actually selling? What's that cost? How many of those things do you need to sell within a given period of time to be successful? How quickly are you growing that sales apparatus. And then with, with subscriptions, it's going to also be metrics around total number of active subscribers that you have, and then churn or how many users are going away within a period of time. And so these are the components that really matter to your business. So if you've got a subscription company and you're not tracking these five, this is where I would start. I would say, get started here, look at those unit economics and make sure that you have a model that you understand and can clearly articulate before you go and spend a bunch of money on channel development and Facebook ads and hiring a bunch of people. Get your story down in terms of the metrics that actually build your model and that you're going to build that company off of. So there's a lot of data on this sheet, but basically this shows a, a growth model for the first year of a hypothetical business that happens to be um, a subscription business. With the launch accelerator companies, I do this with each of those companies. They all, all the launch accelerator companies actually use this exact model or a, or a variation of this model when they're pitching investors and when they're trying to raise money because it's really simple to read. But notice those unit economics at the top. I've got a subscription cost. That's how much I make per unit. 
I've got a monthly growth rate that I've projected into the future. So I want to grow most startups. If you're, especially if you're trying to raise money, you need to grow roughly 20% month over month growth. What's your churn? You plug that into the model. How many people do you have kind of in the model starting? It becomes your new subscriber, your starting subscriber. And what do you think it's going to cost you to actually go out and acquire a customer? And what you can do here, and we've done something similar for Growth University. When we raised money, we pitched something very, very similar to this that shows your growth over a set amount of time. Monthly specifically is what we look at here. So we'll look at growth rate, the number of subscribers, the number of active subscribers, how many folks are falling off at the end of every month, right? We track that churn. That gives us an MRR, or monthly recurring revenue. And then from that, we can approximate how much money we need to basically get the next batch of customers the next month. And the reason why we do that is because we, we start to have a sense of the channels that work. So we know we can go out on Facebook and acquire customers on Facebook. Some of you here came in probably because you saw our ad on Facebook or on Google or maybe on Twitter, or maybe you saw some of our thought leadership or other things out there. We then take that projection and we put it back into our growth channels, right? So if we don't understand those unit economics and we don't understand relatively what we're going after on a month to month basis, then we don't really even know how much to spend when we go back to approach the actual channel. So I would say this is an opportunity to get highly organized around the model itself. The next thing you could do is you could start to layer in more of the, what I call scratch p &L. So you can start to add in some of your costs. So your marketing budget, plus maybe your headcount cost, maybe you've got some capital expenses as well. Maybe you've got an office space. This doesn't have to be perfect. This is You're not trying to be an accountant here. What you're trying to do is prove out your model in a way that makes sense to you and your team and to potential investors. And you can clearly articulate where the money is going and what your spend is going to be over time that's going to net you X number of results. So I can look at this model and I can say, well, in year one, I'm expecting close to 80,000 in revenue off of a roughly $100,000 marketing budget. My headcount cost is going to be 240,000, which means I'm going to lose $260,000 in that year. Well, guess what I need to do? As the founder, I need to make sure that we have $260,000 to burn through, right? And so that becomes part of the fundraising story when I go out and I'm, and I'm attempting to raise money. So these models can be used both for fundraising and organization internally, as well as something that you can give to your marketing team and your, and your leadership within your startup. And maybe that's just you and your co-founder right now, but it keeps you on the same page and it gives you a model that you're working from day in and day out with your company. Um, we'll send out a version of this after, um, if you're interested in kind of like the actual underlying model or have questions about it, just reach out to me, uh, over email or in Slack. When we talk about customer acquisition and, um, and activation, I, I use this concept called EPAG a lot. So most acquisition campaigns kind of hand off to the product at some certain point in time. It's usually at the website level, or maybe it's an app download. Think of your EPAG or your endpoint acquisition goal as a specific conversion metric that you track that handles that intersection from top of funnel over to product. And so when you think about that, and I'll show you an example of some of these EPAG metrics here, at the top of funnel, you're going to want to track things like how many unique visitors am I getting to my site? Am I getting people to um, you know, over to my property? Are they kicking the tires? How many clicks am I getting? What's my click-through rate? What's my cost per click? These are all kind of high-level marketing uh, unit economics that your marketing team or your growth team or your performance marketers are probably going to own. The next level down, though, are these EPAG and product metrics. Um, and these are some of my favorites. So how many downloads are you getting? What are your email capture rates looking like? How many free trials did you get? Most companies need one or two of these EPAG metrics that help them kind of normalize their metrics across the board. Um, and then eventually you're gonna to get to revenue metrics. So new subscribers, purchases, and um, customer acquisition costs and stuff like that. But the game you're in really is that you, at the top of funnel, go and find channels that you can be successful in. Then those channels are only successful when you actually do something through the channel in the form of that EPAG metric. So, so are, are my ads leading to downloads? Is the stuff we're doing in Facebook for us, like we track email captures and webinar signups as two of our EPAG metrics. Like if we spend money on Facebook, I wanna understand what the return on that capital is. And, it, and it's not even a revenue metric at this point, right? Because revenue is a lagging indicator. A subscription is a lagging indicator of 
earlier success in a channel and then in a conversion. So your EPAG metrics are really gonna be downloads, um, they're gonna be app installs, they're gonna be email captures, they're gonna be demo request forms, they're gonna be free trial signups, right? Uh, they're gonna be get in touch with us, contact us and those types of things. Um, and that's a really important band to look at, which to traditionally is probably owned by your product team. And I would urge you to kind of join forces between product and marketing to really understand what's happening at that EPAG and product level and to prove out whether or not what you're doing top of funnel is actually ending up with new subscribers and purchases through this conversion pathway. So align those teams if you've got them. In terms of reporting back, again, you see a lot of the same themes. So marketing, um, and this dashboard is available on the Growth University blog, so you can go there and you can you can actually just download like a Google Sheet that has all this in it. But when we look at our growth metrics on a weekly basis, we're looking at the top of funnel marketing metrics, and then our EPAG product metrics. For us, um, it might be, or for you, it might be a free trial sign up. So you look at that percent visit. So the visitors that are coming to the site, what percent of them are converting to a trial? Because if they're just visiting, who cares? It's not really qualified traffic. You need them to do something. You need to push them along the journey. What's happening in terms of revenue? What percentage of your trial users are turning into actual subscribers and are spending money with you? Um, and then finally, some of your spend and CAC metrics, what's happening kind of bottom of funnel in terms of that spend and that return on spend. When you, when you start to kind of look at data on a weekly basis, you start to spot trends. So the stuff in yellow are positive signals within my model here that I can look at. And I can say, well, in week seven, um, you know, we did certain things that impacted the week. In week six, we did things that impacted week seven positively. Or in week five, we did things that impacted all the items in red here for trial to subscribe. What happened there, right? Like we started Twitter ads and it drove a lot of unqualified traffic. And, and the only way we really see the lack of ability of Twitter to be a viable channel at this point is by seeing it in the metrics when it comes to a conversion. Because when you look at Twitter and you're getting a ton of ads from Twitter that are generating clicks, you might feel good about yourself because I'm getting a bunch of clicks, but are those clicks actually converting, right? Now, those are the things that actually matter that are not vanity metrics that matter when you're growing your business. Sorry about my dog. Um, the next step is you wanna, um, it's either dogs or kids or you know something else is gonna, gonna barge in pretty much every time. Um, the next thing is you want to ritualize reporting. And again, this takes time and, and organization, but choose an interval to report your metrics on. So I often will use Monday through Sunday um, where we'll, we'll look at the last week's uh, worth of data and we'll look at all those conversion metrics and make sure that we're getting better over time. You want to see those conversion rates improve. They should be going up. Your costs might also be going up, but you want to see those conversion rates over time going up and that you're able to clearly articulate what happened last week? How is that going to impact this week? What is that going to mean for next week? How am I going to hit my June numbers? Starting to think about it now, right? These are conversations. I mean, we're, we're having conversations within Growth University right now as we embark on new channels, right? Because whatever we're doing today is not going to show up today or tomorrow, but it might show up next week or in two weeks or in a month. So you got to get this process down and ritualize that reporting. So for us, that's like every Monday, we'll, we'll typically try to look at this stuff. Uh, the awareness flow, so again, this is fairly basic stuff, but when you're in channels and you're starting to look at channels, the really the biggest decision point as a marketer you need to make is, do your customers know that they've got a problem and are they looking for a solution to that problem? And so some of us that is true and others it's not true. And for some of us, there's a little bit of a blend here, but in general, broad strokes, if somebody has a problem that they're looking for a solution for, search engine marketing, and search engine optimization are likely going to be your two best channels because there's a there's a solution that you provide and the user is seeking that solution but you may also be successful in paid social in other ways but if a user doesn't know that they've got a problem paid social and influencers and content marketing and some of your up channel stuff that you might do uh, is going to be a lot more relevant than sem and seo if somebody doesn't know they've got a problem and they're not searching for it you might spend your next year working on an SEO strategy that does nothing for you because there's no solution that you're solving for yet. You can't, you can't find those users because those users aren't looking for you. And so paid social and influencers and that content marketing loop is where you'd want to go from that perspective. These are things we think about a lot when we're kind of talking through our different growth scenarios and growth programs. 
The other thing that you can do to jumpstart your learning uh, in terms of channels to get started with is, is to kind of look at what some of your competition is doing. And so, you know, your friends, the tools here, you've got Google Webmaster Tools. Uh, so um, if you're not currently using Google Webmaster Tools with, the, uh, with their search, um, search planner, basically what they'll do is they'll give you the results of your organic searches in terms of the impressions and the clicks that you're getting on the organic side, because you can't see that in Google Analytics anymore. So Google Webmaster Tools in the Search Console is where you'll get that. You can use products like SpyFu and SEMrush, Arefs, and then the Facebook Ad Library, which I have pulled up here with our ads. You know, some of these tools let you get really pretty deep in terms of seeing exactly what your competitors are doing. So if I were going to spin up a competitor at Growth University, one of the first things I'm going to do is look at what we're doing on Facebook. Because if we're running and spending money on Facebook with these modern, more recent ads here, these are the culmination of a bunch of experiments we tried earlier that may or may not have worked quite as well, right? So you can go to a competitor's page basically and pull down all of the ads that they've done over the last, I think they give you like 18 months of data here. And you can basically beg, borrow and steal from what your competitive landscape is doing. And this is a great way to get creative inspiration and to get ideas around what ads should I be running, at least in, in Facebook and Instagram, because you can literally see what they're doing. You can't see the metrics, but if you put in like calm.com here and you see what calm.com is doing, I guarantee you the fact that they're, you know, they're a multi-billion dollar startup and they've got a giant growth team and a lot of performance marketers, I guarantee you the ads that show up here are the best of the best of the best because it's what they've proven out and they know work. So you may see some experimental stuff in there as well, but the stuff that is there is stuff that's tried and true for them. Uh, and, and that's just a great way to kind of get started. Um, kind of going back here, if it decides to load, great. The next step we're going to talk about is activation. So with acquisition, again, you have this handoff between acquisition and activation at the product level. That's your EPAG metric. So again, it's a free trial, it's a sign up, it's a demo request form, it's a it's an app install. You're going to then have the job of trying to move the user through the buyer journey to get them to some end state, which usually is some kind of revenue metric, right? But most of us don't have the luxury of being able to skip steps. So for most of us, we're going to have an EPAG metric, and then we're going to have multiple different next steps or next stages in the buyer journey that we have to relentlessly track, right? To understand what, what is the end goal I'm going to get based on what I'm trying to do. So if you've got three steps or four steps or two steps along that activation journey, each and every one of them should have the goal of either moving the user to the next step that you know leads to revenue or that end goal or directly leads to that end goal. And so I like to look at this as a loop because a lot of folks think that you could just go from like acquisition to end goal. And it almost never happens that way unless you sell a product that's like five bucks or, or under $25 and it's gonna be an impulsive buy. Uh, you know, so, so, and, and this kind of works across industries and, and verticals too. So just be super mindful of each of those stages of the customer journey and those steps of activation. Now, the next thing is when you're thinking about those activation stages, one of the, one of the interesting places to kind of start is on onboarding. And I use this example a lot in, in a bunch of my programs, but watch how Miro both adds value to the, to the onboarding process, as well as pushes me up against their pricing constraints and really focuses on getting me to buy. And I'm going to walk you through. I've got a bunch of screenshots to show you here. So Miro, for those of you who don't know, is an um, online collaborative whiteboarding product that lets you build process flows. In fact, that chart that I showed you was built using Miro. You could do whiteboarding. You could do all sorts of like collaborative things with the product. It's a great product and they're an extraordinarily fast growing startup in the kind of low end, lower cost B2B space. They've got a subscription model. Okay, so top of funnel, they relentlessly focus on getting you into signing up for a free trial. So in another talk, I, I kind of dissect like how they do that up funnel. But 
if you've ever seen a Miro ad on Twitter or on Facebook, or you Google Miro and you hit their landing page, you'll see that it's just, it uses social proof and they're absolutely amazing at getting their messaging across to, to basically get you excited about signing up for the free trial. Once you click that free trial button, this is the screen you get. So get started free today, no credit card required. Name, work email, password. I agree to the terms, get started now, or I can sign up with any of these social proof uh, logins. Somebody had asked, um, I forget where it was, but in one of the channels that I'm in, they had asked like, should I invest time in social login? My general take is like, if there's no virality built into your onboarding or within your product, that there's no network effect that's going to be gained by including like the social auth sign-ins, then it's probably not worth your time right now to do it. But for Miro, what I'm about to walk you through, I think is going to prove out why they actually included all of these options. So I complete step one. Now they ask me to set up my team, enter my team name. What is my role in the company? So they're kind of in a really sneaky way, just getting me to tell them a bunch of info. Oh, how big is your company? Should anybody with my domain be allowed to join? Set up and continue. Invite teammates. Didn't we already kind of, okay, they're asking me my team name role. Okay, well, now invite my teammates. They let me invite from Slack, invite from Gmail. They let me copy a link and send it to somebody in a work messenger. They let me drop emails in. I mean, they, they literally give me every possible way to invite my teammate into the product. Then after I've done that, they get me into use the product. So what do I want to do? Workshops, meetings, research, design, mapping, diagramming. Okay. They get you to actually personally select like what you want to do. And then they bring you into, so I selected meeting and workshops. Look at all these amazing options they give me for doing meetings and workshops better. They, they give me the data and it's personalized to me. I told them this is what I want. Again, this takes a lot of engineering behind the scenes, but it's highly personalized and it works. Well, what did they do here? So their EPAG and point acquisition goal metric is a free plan. So that that's like what their conversion metric is. But then their next step is that I create a board and or I invite a teammate. Then I create a second or third board and then I upgrade. But the reason why I upgrade is because when I got through and invited a teammate and the teammate went through the same process, the teammate invited another teammate. I've got three people on Miro on my plan now. When we get through onboarding, I created a board, my teammate created a board, and my teammate's teammate created a board. Three boards have been created. Boom. We upgrade. We have to upgrade if we want to do anything with the plan. So they let us use the product. They let us collaborate. They make it easy to collaborate. They make it easy to share an onboard. But the brilliance in this model is that they just bumped us up against their payment constraint. Their entire activation strategy pushes me up against that. And it's absolutely brilliant right? So I guess the takeaway for you, I mean, Miro has had a lot of time in the market. They've got a lot of capital. I mean, that is pretty much the best process I've ever seen for the onboarding. What are the things that you can do um, maybe with less of a budget? Well, you can look at each stage of that funnel and, and look at your goals and try to map uh, actions to a goal at each stage of your journey and pick off the lowest effort, highest return items that you think you can work on. So so if you're a product that 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 there would be value in getting teammates in to use the product with the person that you're basically selling to on those set of screens right now that you're onboarding, then build in some of that virality right into the model. If you have a different business model, think about like those actions that the user at that stage during onboarding can take that you can add more value to and that they can, they can basically help extend the reach of your product. And that's kind of like in the product-led growth vein. Framework this stuff out. So if you go to Intercom and you search for Intercom Rice, they, there's something called the Rice Framework, which will let you basically plug in a bunch of ideas that you have for like moving the needle. So you, you plug in a bunch of like onboarding ideas or other growth test ideas that you have, and it will basically give you the stack rank list of what you should do in what order based on what the highest return on your investment in time and capital is going to be for the feature that you're building. I've got my own version of this. That's part of like the mastering growth curriculum. I call it ICE. And, and the reason why I created my own is because I include the engineering um, and the other organizational efforts like marketing into the mix. And so when we go really deep in a product strategy and we're trying to figure out like, what do we build when and why I kind of have like my own version of this, but it was, it's a derivative of 
that intercom rice framework, which is fantastic. And then the two things you can do with activation is you can either go like really deep in one conversion point. So like focus on your landing page to try to get more people into the free trial. And just relentlessly iterate over that till you increase that percentage. Or you can go really broad and you can just try to pick off low hanging fruit at each step of that journey. Find the weakest part of your onboarding experience. I mean, I just went through this this week where uh, for, for our growth university program, I used a separate account and went through our onboarding again. I mean, I basically do it every week and we found a whole bunch of issues that we frantically then fixed after, right? You have to like go through that process and relentlessly focus on trying to increase those uh, experiences day in and day out for your customers so that you increase those metrics. Last section today is on retention. I'm not gonna get through this in 30 minutes, so I apologize. It'll probably be, this will take about 10. Retention takes a long time to really understand, like three months, six months, think a year, right? And so because of that, you have to have other metrics that you look at that can tell you whether or not you're on the right track. So you use what's called proxy metrics to gauge future retention. And I'm going to walk you through some examples here in a minute. So the proxy retention metric is an action metric. It's something that your user does that basically shows you how likely it is that that user is going to be retained. Again, so we're going to look at retention from like a three month, six month, year, two year state of mind. So you need a year to really understand a report back on what your true retention looks like. So you need proxies that basically help you predict what future retention is going to be. This is the name of the game. If you're a product manager or you're a growth marketer, like this should be one of the most important things for you. So for Netflix, Netflix has shown that if they can get a user to consume 19 hours of content per month, that user will not churn. This is some of this is public data. Some of this I pulled from some work that Gibson Biddle, who is one of the VPs of Netflix, has produced, and, and he does all sorts of talks. Google him. If you're in the product manager space, it's absolutely amazing. With Growth Minded. Um, the earlier version of Growth University, we wanted to get students to consume 10 lessons because if we could get a student to consume 10 lessons, then that student is probably not going to go away. With Zoom, it's all about getting free users to set up multiple calls over a certain number of weeks so that they know that that user is going to stick around. And for Sandbox, which is the last company I was at, if we could get letter senders to send two letters in their first week, they're hooked. They're not going to go away right? Sorry about the noise. There's all sorts of stuff going on upstairs here. I don't know if my mic is picking it up. But these are proxy metrics. These are things that happen in real time or in more or less real time that are going to absolutely impact your future retention metric, okay? Now, a lot of stuff is talked about with activation curves and product market fit. How do you know when you've got product market fit? It's when you can plot your proxy metric on a chart and the retention curve flattens, meaning like the users that come in in the month of March, 12 months later, there's still some around. Okay, I'll show you another screen. Actually, I, I don't have that screen. I must have taken it out. But with early stage startups, what you often will see is that users come in and by the end of six months, there's a straight line down to zero, meaning that the user is just gone and they never come back for the most part, right? Once you kind of burn through a user, it's highly unlikely you're going to win them back. So with with cohorts and with product market fit you're gonna start to see that not all of your customers go away that at a certain point in time that curve flattens and and this is some kind of action so it's a percentage of users that are activated doing that thing within the product that they need to do it's like with netflix this is hours watched what percentage of users within each month that came in are watching 19 hours of content when that curve flattens we know that we found product market fit uh, at least within a certain set of channels the other thing to look at are user cohorts and so what you do here is you plot your subscribers or your users who came in in month zero that's the sign up month how many of them are still how many from month zero are around in month one two three four five and six so in the month of January, you got 500 new users. In the month of February, you got 650 new users. In month one, which is from January, it's February, and from February, it's March, right? You've got 350 and 350. You plot this out and you look at the percentages. This is your classic cohort retention chart. 
right? Where you can start to spot trends. What you again want to see here is that your metrics are improving over time. So what I've highlighted in red here is that in the month of April, um, I had 90% of my users still around the next month. And 95% of the users who came in in May were still around in June versus 53.85% of users who came in in February and were still here in March, right? This is a very, very strong signal that my product is getting better, my value prop is getting better, my retention is getting better over time. And this is one of the things that I obsess over with Growth University, right? As a founder, this chart, these aren't the Growth University numbers, by the way, this is a totally, this is, this is all made up data, right? So I made it look really interesting, but this is what I basically obsess over. How many customers are coming in, right? And how many of them are sticking around over the next number of months? And the way that we get to our proxy metric is, are people actually consuming our content? Yes or no? If people just come in and they buy an account and they don't take any of our programs, they don't do any of the master classes, we haven't made that connection and they're much more likely to churn, right? So that's kind of what we look at. Oh, I do have this chart. It's just in the wrong place. So this is an example of like different, different months plotted. It's the same data here, just plotted visually. So you can see that um, some of the earlier months here, it's basically like a race to the bottom, you know, like this line here, I think that's, what is that, January? Um, there's like nobody left at the end of six months. But notice April and May, they're almost flat from the start. That means like I've got some sense of product market fit. Those users are coming in and they're sticking around month over month over month. Now, this might fall off a cliff in month three, we don't know, right? So we have to let these play out. But this is the type of chart that you need to be looking at to show whether or not your model is actually working or not, right? So we focus a lot of this on the mastering growth program and stuff. The other thing that we look at is retention by channel. So not all channels are gonna give you the same. So if you look at retention overall and you're like, oh man, my retention is bad or my retention is great. What's hidden is what's happening at the channel level. So again, hypothetical examples here, but you can see here that my referral channel is driving users that just aren't sticking around. They're almost all gone by the end of six months, but they were free. Referrals are typically free, or maybe I monetize the, you know, the, the um, refer -er side of the equation. Google, I had to spend a bunch of money to get people in, but they were seeking a solution to a growth problem that they have, and they found our courses and they love us, right? And so they come in and after six months, almost 70% of them, 75% of them are still around. So retention by channel, Again, this is advanced stuff. It's gonna be hard to kind of plot this, but if you've got the data, plot it out and just give yourself a good objective view of what's happening on a channel basis. And what this would tell me, so if you showed me, I don't care really what your product is, if you showed me this and, and you said, hey Craig, what should I do? I would say, spend as much money as possible on Google. Maybe don't focus on the referral campaigns and figure out what the heck's happening with Facebook. Why is it coming in they're using it and then they drop off? Did, was that some kind of offer you put out there, they get two months for free and then they get billed and then they fall off the deep end, right? But I would come back and I'd say, based on this data, I, I would reinvest and double down on Google SEM and I'd probably build an SEO strategy because it shows that like those high intent users stick around even though it might cost us more money to get them. And then when it comes to like LTV, lifetime value, again, this is a lagging indicator. What you want to see here is that over time, your three, six, and 12 month LTV is is rising. Again, this is a long-term metric, but you can find signals earlier. So a lot of folks, when, when you talk about, when they talk about LTV, talk about like total lifetime value over the lifetime of my company over 12 months, but really like I'm interested in what happened in the last three months compared to the three months before that. Is your LTV rising? That's a sign of a healthy business. Are more customers coming in spending more money with you or sticking around longer? This doesn't have to be a revenue metric right? This might be a metric that's more focused on uh, product usage. Um, thinking like a media company, for example, like it's hard to plot LTV in a similar manner unless you're plotting number of subscribers back to like, uh, you know, ad revenue or something. So 
like at Red Tricycle, we would look at LTV, but it'd be totally different than how we look at LTV with Growth University. But the point is that you want to get these shorter intervals of time in. Ideally, you've got a one month window, a three month, six month, and 12 month, and that that LTV is getting better over time. What happened in July where I ended up with a $54 LTV? Something happened in that month that was never repeated again. Now down here, it hasn't been 12 months, so we don't have all of July's data yet, right? But why didn't the same thing happen in August and why was it so much higher? So I would go back, when I do audits and stuff with startups, I'll go back and say like, what happened in that month? Oh, we changed our product and or we, you know, we, we added this thing and then we turned it off or we tried this pricing, but it didn't seem to work and we turned it Well, it turns out that pricing did work. You killed it off maybe before you should have killed it off or vice versa. And then three to six month, LTV becomes a proxy for 12. Yellow is positive, red is negative. I think you get the point. That's it.